I'm Susanna Schick. I'm your moderator today. And um, I work, I do sustainability consulting for fashion designers. I teach them how to find more environmental fabrics, which ones are the most environmental fabrics, what's really relevant for their line, because not everything is relevant for every designer. And uh, so today we have a really interesting panel, starting with, on my left, Jason Kibbe, the CEO and founder of Pact Apparel. My name is Jason Kibbe, and I have no fashion background uh, in general. Uh, my, my apparel background at, at all is uh, designing environmental campaigns for Patagonia. Uh, but I, 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 with a colleague, Jeff Denby, a business school colleague of mine, started Pact about two years ago. We make organic premium underwear that connects with social and environmental campaigns. My name is MJ Prest. I am the editor-in-chief of ethicalstyle.com. <clears throat> Um, my background is in print journalism, um, but we founded Ethical Style in 2008. Uh, we focus on environmental issues as well as social issues, um, fair trade, organic cotton, um, animal rights, sweatshop labor, kind of the whole gamut. And Hi everybody, my name is Raisa Girona. Um, I am the designer and co-owner of Bridget Catisse. We launched the line, my partner is here, Damien, taking pictures for our blog, Closet Obsession. Uh, we launched the line in 2008, and everything that we make is made from recycled vintage fabric. So everything is hand cut, hand sewn, and made locally in downtown Los Angeles. I'm Anna Griffin. I'm the founder and editor in chief of Coco Eco Magazine, and we are the world's first and only uh, high fashion. Uh, beauty, celebrity, and cause-related publication. We are digital, and actually I was a model. Um, I traveled all over the world and, and was very blessed to see some very beautiful things uh, that inspired me into a great love affair for the planet. When, um, you know, after An Inconvenient Truth came out, we were all sort of sitting in shock, and I particularly wanted to do something, so I chose to start a magazine with absolutely no experience. I was just a girl with a vision. Uh, two years later, it's really exciting, we are moving into live fashion events, so we're doing New York Fashion Week next, ye uh, next year. We're also doing a live show in Brazil uh, in October. Um, I've been asked to do a live fashion event in the Caribbean in the spring, and we're also going to be bringing commerce into our site in an effort to support uh, both sustainable designers and beauty brands, and also make a product accessibility easier for you guys as our readers and consumers. Um, I think the most exciting thing for us is we're sort of billed as the Vogue uh, for a new generation because we are, you know, very, very conscientious. Everything we do is ethical and actually the same with ethical style, whether it's fair trade, it's uh, animal rights, it's cause, it's women's issues. I mean, you name it, we are really a cause-based publication but wrapped up in a very, very glossy, very sexy package. In this age when greenwashing is rampant, how do you differentiate a truly green brand and in turn make that difference valuable to the consumer? Who'd like to start? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, greenwashing is something that is really terrible and it's out there rampantly in, in green fashion. I mean, most of the stuff that you see, they may do one or two things sustainably, but when you really look uh, behind the scenes, it, it's pretty terrible. And I, I think if, if you're looking to start your own label or if you're looking at this as a consumer or someone who just cares about this, look for how transparent the company is because it's impossible to make sustainable clothing. You'll have some sort of an impact no matter what you do. And those who come clean about the things that they do badly, even if they uh, celebrate the things that they do really well, those are the ones who really are not the greenwashers. And I think it's not just uh, relegated to the environmental realm either. There's also a lot of, um, I call it kind of pink washing because of the breast cancer awareness stuff. It isn't always, your purchase isn't always supporting the cause that you think it is. So what are some of the new tools and methods or some new techniques that you're seeing develop in the area of sustainable fashion that most excite and inspire you? Like I hear a lot about recycling. I hear a lot about digital printing. Um, you know, there's more and more farmers coming on board with organic. So it'd be interesting to hear, because I remember a few years ago, I did some research on organic cotton, and it was hard to find non-toxic uh, defoliants, you know, so it was something that just getting the cotton out of the plant was extremely toxic, and so people were doing it by hand. So 
What are some things that you know you're hearing about lately that you think are really exciting? Yes, um, there's some really cool stuff going on. I mean, you've got recycling and upcycling, and um, you know, like Racer, they take recycled products and then they totally uh, cut again from scratch and upcycle and make something new out of it, uh, which is awesome. One of the latest things, actually, and we shot her collection yesterday. There's a <laughs> this is going to gross you all out, but I think it's completely genius. She um, Leila Hafsi, which is one of Kokuiko's favorite designers, and she's just created created a new collection that is uh, much more affordable because usually she was doing these fabulous sort of red carpet ready dresses um, that were a pretty penny. Um, but she's got a, a much easier collection now. And what they actually do, they are, uh, it's organic fibers and they are woven by these small co-ops co in Nepal and India. And then actually once they're woven as a way to uh, antibacterialize the fiber, they are soaked in goat urine, would you believe? Because it is a natural <laughs> antibiotic. I know, right? It's sexy. I, as I Finding what is already here, I think, is what to me is always exciting. It's what, what we based our business on, making stuff that, you know, I started the company. I have no, absolutely no fashion background. I didn't go to fashion school. I was just an avid, crazy flea market shopper that went to Goodwill like every day of my life. And just seeing how much stuff there was um, still today is what inspires the company, is what inspires me to make um, new clothes from old clothes. And actually, you should uh, model for us, stand up and tell us about your outfit. Jeez. <laughs> um, I won't stand up, but okay. uh, well, really on, briefly. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. Everything I'm wearing is uh, recycled, and it's from our line, Bridget Catisse. I'm wearing a leather skirt, so this was really huge and long. I just had to taper it down. But what's for our fashion students out here? What's difficult is that we have to make a lot of patterns just to make the skirt because it m comes from all different shapes of leather skirt, if that makes sense. Um, and then this is from a very, very crazy old, like grandma's, uh, like really long, long dress that we made into a top. And then this final thing that I'm wearing is from a men's blazer, again, cut down. The lining has been changed. Um, and it's really cute, right? <laughs> uh, when you go into a store that we sell to, you will never you know, think that it was recycled until you looked at the, um, the label. Well, it's interesting for me to hear um, all the different ways that people can, uh, the designers can get, you know, inspired and decide to take their own initiative uh, and create a market for it. So um, I come from a much more commercial background, but um, it's great to see, you know, you guys, you know, you take your passion and you, and, and you go. And, and for the big companies like Patagonia or our company, or Jason's company, it's the ethos, you know. You, you, you can't imagine ever doing it any other way. It's not, can you be sustainable? It's, there's no other way to do business. You, we have to. So um, I think that kind of mindset is, that's something new um, in the last, you know, five, five ten years. Um, there's some, there's innovation going on everywhere. Um, a lot of recycled um, fabrics. So you, you want to look for, you know, the, the mills and the fabric companies that are trying to innovate. Mm -hmm. um. Um, so next, um, we hear a lot about reducing consumption and in, in the sustainability community, it's all talk about just buy less stuff. But really what it comes down to, I mean, even Patagonia recently made a statement about trying to influence consumers to purchase less stuff. Now, um, the problem is reduced consumption is a direct cause of recession. So we look at the recession we're in now and you know, part of that's brought on by the fact that we're buying less stuff. Um, so does environmental sustainability have to come at the expense of economic sustainability? What can companies do to promote responsible economic growth? I think it actually goes hand in hand. I mean, you know, if you're doing something uh, for the planet, obviously you're going to be consuming less. If you're consuming less, you're spending less. That's just, it is, is what it is. So how can we actually create a win out of that where... Uh, the country, say for example the United States, actually gets to flourish economically now, which it desperately needs to do. And you know, one of my big things is we need to bring manufacturing back here home. It's got to be done locally and in a way that can compete with China and Asia. So how do we do that? I mean, how can we make it affordable and easy and accessible for uh, designers so, such that you can get stuff made in, in the USA and support the economy and the workforce uh, and still have it be sustainable? I like to think of um, kind of the whole consumption 
uh, industry as a pyramid. So at the very top of the pyramid, you have this group that's very like label conscious. They're very, they, they want status symbols. They, have, they want the best that money can buy. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you have people who don't care about quality or where it's made. They just want to make sure they're getting the best deal possible. And generally right now, the entire sustainable fashion industry is targeting this middle segment, which is you know, willing to pay a little bit more for better quality or for making sure that it's produced in a transparent, you know, ethical way. Um, but they're not gonna, they don't wanna spend a ton of money. And I think the best thing that the sustainable fashion industry can do is to expand their reach down and up. Prada just came out with a fair trade-ish it's not certified, but it's um, it's called the Made In Collection, and it's it's still got the Prada um, label, and it's still got the Prada quality, but they're kind of giving a nod to um, locally made materials and the artisans who are making it in India, in Peru, um, in developing countries. I, I would challenge though, the premise of that question uh, because it the the economy in which has gone down is is essentially making cheap shit that doesn't help anybody yes. and i don't think the world needs cheap shit that doesn't help anybody and i don't i don't believe that that that's one of our premises uh, at Pact is that we're going to expand the types of products that that we uh, we we sell, but we actually have a design rule which says we will never make shit the world doesn't need. And I think that the, an economy made on things that the world doesn't need is not an economy that we should be trying to you know reach to. And so I I actually don't think that the best thing I can do is figure out how to still maintain some mantle of greenness and get my underwear down to two dollars a pair I, and so that people throw it out after three months of use i actually think the best thing i can do is you know, maybe get it i i agree with uh, mj's comment get it more affordable but get it to the point where it's still a item that articulates my customers values that helps out the things that they believe in that has a supply chain that you can be proud of that reduces the carbon footprint all of these things aren't going to come cheapest 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 and so i think we we really if we're designing and we're we're building things for kind of a, a next generation or a reset of the economy it really needs to be things that articulate the values and, and help people. And maybe that's not always going to be done as cheaply as possible. Absolutely. Plus, people always need underpants. <laughs> that's why we're in it. <laughs> so it's like, I cannot make it cheaper. That's, that, that's just the bottom line, unfortunately. But I have to go off the fact that what I do is special, and it's one of a kind, and that's the selling point, and period. And the whole thing with um, fast fashion, and um, in the age of fast fashion, do you think we should be trying to change consumer behavior to get people to, you know, buy these more classic pieces, or should we be looking more at finding ways of fa uh, making fast fashion more sustainable? And I know none of you are actually, you know, designing for H and M or you know Zara or whatever, so it's a whole different aesthetic when you're, you know, trying to do your own small line and then compete against that because they have the volume, you know, they they can they have the efficiency of scale that they can charge ridiculously low prices where, you know, it's, it's hard to compete with. So, um, but, you know, maybe to speaking to uh, MJ and, and Anna, um, how do you see, you know, getting consumers or, you know, what do you see can be done to get consumers more interested in sort of slowing it down and buying something that's really lasting? H&M last year on Earth Day released something called the Garden Collection. And it was... It was basically presented as as sustainable, um, and there were I mean there were good things about it, but it was still fast fashion. It was and um, I mean probably the best thing that they did though was make it a limited a limited edition, and it sold out in a, in a hot minute. Um, so you would then go on eBay and you'd see like this forty dollar dress that was now being sold like resold for two hundred and fifty dollars, which to me is completely defeating the point of fast fast fashion. First of all and of sustainable fashion. Um, so I think if, if you look at, um, I mean, it's, it's just kind of a basic psychological principle that if you make something limited edition and one of a kind, uh, like Raisa was saying, you can basically kind of drive up demand for that. Um, but you have, to, you have to do it in a very sort of targeted way. Uh, and we were having a conversation about this earlier, Susanna, and you know, you go into these stores like Forever 21 and you see the scores of teenagers that are standing on a Saturday afternoon to buy some top 
to where to the local disco and there's a little disclaimer on the counter that says, oh, the store sells products known to contain chemicals to give you cancer, which is Prop 65, correct, MJ? Okay. So with that, it's like, you know, really I think there has to be an education to the consumer. Look at what you're buying. Look at the uh, power you have with your dollar to vote. And there, there is one brand, it's a British brand, that um, just started doing a, um, it's ASOS.com, ASOS.com, and they're now doing um, basically like an online clothing swap. So if you've bought something from them, you can then trade it with somebody else who also is on that website, who also likes their design aesthetic, and get something that's new to you. Because um, uh, with H&M, you know, there was the big scandal recently about they were just sort of uh, mutilating clothing and throwing them in the dumpster that people hadn't bought. And they could have sold it to you to remake into something new and fabulous. Yeah, well, it's easier. I know. I, <laughs> I actually thought about that in a, a while ago in a project where it was like, wait, they, they try to get new stock in every day. Yeah. And so the old stock has to go somewhere. And, you know, you could go to talented designers and say, here, you know, make this into something new. You know, it's, it's yeah. not that out of fashion. It's yeah. from yesterday. Beyond marketing, what does sustainable fashion really mean? Like from sourcing to supply chain to, store, to the store design, how many cumulative efforts truly enable the brand to be sustainable? And it's true there's no such thing as 100% sustainable clothing or any product. You know, it all has an impact. So maybe um, Jason and Dale could take us through the process, um, start to finish, you know, um, from from the cotton plantation or plantation from the cotton farm, I <laughs> 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 um, So from the cotton farm to the store, uh, let's let's talk about your process. Um, so start with Jason, and then we'll go to Dale. I, I actually think Dale sh would probably be better to lead with this. I I okay. I don't do this side of the business. I I know it, but this is uh, Dale's area. I'm going to say one thing though that that is just to throw us a little bit off course though. Um, that uh, the most important thing I think is uh, that we often on these kinds of panels talk about it. Well, if you do X, Y, and Z, that will be great. The most important thing to have a sustainable clothing company is to make a really good product. Mm -hmm. The sustainability doesn't matter if your stuff doesn't sell. Basically, because everything is one of a kind, um, the buyer has to pick, and they don't know until they open their shipment what they're getting. So it's very <laughs> full of surprises. Um, but we, like for instance, um, we narrowed down as far as prints. Like you are either going to choose from animal, solid, tribal. Um, and then from there, we go to what they call rag houses, which is, to me, the best place you can go to. It's like a Goodwill, but like 50,000 square feet of awesomeness. And I go there and I pick all day um, based on the orders we have. So for instance, um, I had 100 orders of tribal print. I have to pick 100 tribal prints of something to make. And and then we wash it, and then from there it goes to downtown, and each one gets cut. And so um, it's very stressful because sometimes you don't find it, but 99% of the time I, I do because that's how much stuff there is out there. There's so much stuff, and there's so many rag houses locally. I want to be proud of and that when people go up to buy it, they don't even really know that it's, um, that it's recycled. So, Yeah, definitely. I remember when I was at Burning Torch, they had uh, designed... She designed a jacket that was made from Arctic parkas, like these white um, parkas that they wear in the snow, a snow camo. It was basically so you're camouflaged when you're out fighting a war in the snow. Um, and they were a particular Swiss snow camo. And the uh, design assistant was on the phone every day all over the world. Do you have any of this Swiss snow camo? Like all it just they did not have enough for their orders because you know they had this great sample um and a lot of people loved it so it was tough you know and it's hard when you're when you're dealing with vintage you know to find everything that you need with the global organic textile standard it makes it much harder for us we only have one dye house in the southern half of turkey there's only one place that we can dye our products i mean in my career i've seen you know blue blue rivers turn clear in portugal talking about reducing, you know, the time and temperature, reducing, you know, salt, reducing water, um, being more, more efficient um, with the whole process. But, you know, you, you go to China and you don't ask the questions or you don't visit and see with your own eyes, you have no clue what they're doing. And, and that's where it gets dicey. So the certification, if you buy a certified product, then you know that somebody was looking after it. And you can't always be in China, you know, doing all that. So.
Absolutely. I remember walking the floor at uh, the Magic Sourcing Expo um, in October, and I think it was October. Anyway, uh, talking to different textile vendors, you know, mostly from China, almost predominantly there, and asking them, oh, do you have organic cotton? Do you have bamboo? Do you have recycled polyester? Can you do this in recycled? And it was really interesting to gauge their reactions because these are sales reps. And so some of them were like, oh, yeah, whatever you want, whatever you want. We got it. We got it. And and then other ones were like, well, actually, I'm not so sure, but I can look into it. And that was the one that I was interested in, you know, the one who's not just going to automatically say, yeah, anything you want, because, you know, there are people who will promise you the moon and then just do whatever they're going to do. Um, so uh, at this point, we're going to open it up to the floor. I'd um, love to hear your questions for the panelists. Yes. Do you think this? Do you think sustainability can kill fast fashion? Because I personally think it's a very disgusting trend. I do not like what fast fashion does to small to more established designers. Yeah, no, I mean, oh God, I don't even know what's going to stop fast fashion in its tracks. <laughs> and uh, it's funny, I'm a very, very dear friend of mine. She makes gorgeous, gorgeous costume uh, jewelry. It's all out of recycled sterling silver. And she got ripped off by Forever 21 massively ripped off um and you know you look at that now she was lucky she got a lawyer she fought and she won um but while this is going on with them it's really providing a very very difficult course in general moving forward sustainability is not going to kill fast fashion i don't know what is going to fast kill fast fashion any more so than the education of the consumer and the wake up call the realization that where what am i supporting here what where am i putting my money am i supporting brands that rip others off um, Christy got lucky in winning her case. I know a lot of people that haven't. And Forever 21 have ripped off, you know, Gwen Stefani, um, you name it. They're, they're just out there churning all the time. Um, it's going to be the consumer that kills fast fashion. So it, that goes back to your question earlier, Suzanne, about, you know, the education. And I think designers working in conjunction with lines like Walmart and Target um, and doing sustainable collections, that's really a way to go. It's in the education of the consumer. That's what's going to kill it. I also think it's going to be the consumer educating the big business. I think if you, yeah, as long as there's a demand, I think that the supply will follow. I would actually uh, throw a slightly different perspective that I, I, I actually don't believe that consumers are going to necessarily be the driving force. I think they're only going to be the driving force once they have better alternatives in front of them. And uh, right now... I mean, I, we, we see this when we, when we survey our, our customers that sustainability or the values behind our product is a fourth purchasing criterion at best. And this is with a really, really, really highly educated, super sort of green group of people. And yet it's a fourth criterion. Actually design something that is a, an alternative to fast fashion that makes fast fashion look disgusting. There's such a trend in food right now with locally grown uh, vendors and farmers and food, but in fashion that hasn't translated as much. I know companies like Project Alabama are now growing and milling their own cotton in the southeast so that they have greater visibility of the supply chain. Do you ever see that being something that moves away from the fringe into the mainstream in fashion or becomes more popular? I want to actually start with that one. Um, I, it's, it's something that I've done a lot of research on and also What's funny, you mentioned Project Alabama. I recently was in uh, Lomans and bought a Project Alabama shirt that was made in India. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> but <laughs> that was kind of shocking. Um, but, you know, people in India need jobs. And uh, what's interesting is a lot of the designers I've worked for, because I've been in product development in the industry for since, you know, before time began, um, and in New York and L.A. And New York used to have a really thriving manufacturing base, um, and you know, LA did too. And, and you can still get things done in LA, but like what, um, uh, we were talking about before the thing was that it's, you can't get the one stop shopping you can get in China. So that sort of needs to be, it needs to be as easy to get as good quality, even though it's more expensive, it's always going to be more expensive to make here, but it's the quality is not, I mean, China's quality is so much better than it used to be now. And it's so much easier for designers. So it's something where you can't just, I mean, it's its push and pull. So the customer has to look at the label and go, where is this made? And go, why is this you know, $500 designer dress made in China 
when it used to be made in Italy, why am I going to pay $500 for it still? You know, and so there needs to be that awareness on the consumer level, but there also needs to be something easier for designers so that they don't have to work harder to get stuff made locally than they do to get it made overseas. So I think the future for me for sustainable fashion, it's, it's, it's absolutely um, infinite. And I, what I really would like to see, and I think we are headed much more that way because I think, you know, from, from what I've learned, consumers are starting to care now. Uh, as far as the future of sustainable fashion, um, the Natural Resources Defense Council is doing a lot working, they've been working with some of the larger brands like Nike and Walmart to, you know, really help them to find, they've created this sort of best practices for factories in China. and a lot of factories are sort of coming on board with that. And then they're also now starting to work with the more high-end fashion designers in New York to get them interested in using the more sustainable factories. So it's something where it's like, look, if we're gonna have all these things being made in China, at least let's try to find the factories with the best practices and teach them how to implement those best practices. So that's an option, yeah. Sustainability or sustainable clothing being, or eco-friendly clothing, um, being a little bit more expensive, sustainable clothing, whether it be made domestically, being a little bit more expensive. How has the recession affected um, the cause of sustainability in the garment industry? It's been tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was having a conversation Sorry, with Anna and Suzanne about... I just, um, um, just want to add one thing oh. before I fall and die. Um, <laughs> Just because when we were talking about fast fashion, um, the Forever 21s and the top shops, well, top shop not so much, but the H&Ms, uh, when the recession hit, everybody was very proud that they only spent uh, less than $20 on a pair of jeans or you know, a shirt for $1.50. And people were speaking this way, and um, sustainable all of a sudden went to economically what they could afford. If they love your product, even if it's a little bit more or a lot more expensive, they're going to continue to order because, you know, thankfully people are still ordering them. So our approach is just to be very selective and make sure that we're spending wisely and not, um, you know, basically trying to get as many new accounts as possible because you you don't know if they're gonna they're gonna take the order. The other thing is though too that you know you get what you pay for. If you're spending a dollar fifty on a top, it's gonna fall apart. You know, no matter how well you take care of it. If you're spending twenty bucks on a pair of jeans, you're gonna have to go out in a month or two and spend another twenty bucks and another twenty bucks. And before you know it, you've spent the equivalent over an elongated period of time of what you might have invested in one item that is sustainable, that is still gonna last beyond the keep spending twenty bucks, keep spending twenty bucks. Because that, you know, it's not about quantity, it is about quality. Yeah. yeah, okay, so with that I just wanna add one thing and then we're gonna end. Um, but I think, you know, my sort of mindset has shifted a lot and I'm hoping that this can kind of be a zeitgeist is that instead of taking pride in, oh, I caught that one Lanvin piece at H&M, how about, oh, I saved up for that Lanvin piece that I can pass on to my daughter, you know? Like, I mean, it's something like, why why waste money on, on the, the, the one that's just the brand but really is, is developed and manufactured at the same factory as all the other stuff in that store, when you can spend the money on something that is handmade, you know, in a really, you know, ex, you know ex exquisite manner. So um, with that, I'm sorry, but that's, you know, the end of it. And you guys can talk to us after. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> okay.